Hey guys, this is Andrew with High Level Reviews, and today I'd like to take a look at Final Fantasy XII. The game was released in October of 2006 on the PS2, and is still one of the highest rated critically reviewed games. It was named Best PlayStation 2 Game and Best Role Playing Game by numerous video game journals and websites, including GameSpot, GameSpy, and IGN. From a complex story with many intricately designed and developed central figures that were mostly voiced by classically trained theater actors with little experience in voice acting, to a fighting system that experimented with nearly every possible aspect of combat, Final Fantasy XII took risk while still capturing that classic Final Fantasy feel of intrigue and familiarity without being too derivative. However, these grand and lofty ambitions sometimes led to some inconsistencies in the overall product. As a warning, this is a long review. The game is enormous, 200 plus hours for completionist run and still 60 plus for story alone, and admittedly, that's a pretty quick run through. It contains many twists and revelations pertaining to hidden identities and hidden relationships and political posturing. I'm going to be very careful with cutscenes and will try to avoid spoilers, but just as a warning, due to the very nature of the story, some cutscenes might contain some spoilers. I apologize ahead of time. The game starts with the defeat of the Kingdom of Dalmasca by the Arcadian Empire, and a few highly emotional and action-focused cutscenes. In just a few moments of action, Princess Ash loses her new husband, and it appears as though Captain Bosch von Ronsenberg has betrayed his king and is subsequently imprisoned and vilified by all of Dalmasca. Flash forward two years and you control Vaughn, a young orphan street urchin living in Arcadian-occupied Robinostra, and Pinello, a fellow orphan and the character that frequently balances Vaughn's more reckless side. He longs to free himself from the chains of oppression and is a great way for the game to give you a view of all of the key player's developments from a relatively naive and unexperienced, but exceptionally energetic and upbeat point of view. He and Pinello, and occasionally Larsa, a guest character that is part of the Solidor family that influences and controls a lot of Arcadia's movements and political and military affiliations, help to maintain a near irrepressible positivity and an assiduous do-what-is-right attitude. Both serve to represent the common folk and to keep Ash and occasionally Bosch grounded. Vaughn eventually concocts a plan to steal back a treasure from the palace that he feels belongs to Dalmasca. He runs into Balthair and Fran, two of the stronger characters in the game and both of them sky pirates with a lot of baggage. While escaping the palace, he runs into the remnants of a resistance group and is introduced to Ash, who at this point in the game had been missing for a long time. Bosch is a little trickier to introduce without spoiling some major early game plot points, so I'll just say that he hangs around for a bit before joining the party. Eventually, all six characters come together in an attempt to bring peace to Ivalice and Dalmasca specifically. If that explanation seems vague, it is deliberately so. It's difficult to really hit on specific points due to the nature of the story and my desire to avoid spoilers. Final Fantasy XII's story is replete with tragic deaths, devious backroom meetings and alliances, and political maneuvering. While it doesn't necessarily present you with that singular evil figure to lament for all of the suffering Ivalice, it nevertheless introduces plenty of layered characters and entities. The judges are terrifying and each one has a different feel and appearance. Vane is a complex villain that often displays astounding self-awareness and insight. Even Vana, a being that controls and influences Dr. Sid in various ways, and the exact method of this and level of manipulation is still being debated by fans, is a very diverse and interestingly written character. Vana wants to free humankind from the curious cycle of placing men in power to then control the world, though in a sense is doing exactly that with Nethysite, a powerful source of magical energy in the world of Ivalice. What Final Fantasy XII does right story-wise is refuse to show a black and white objective good and evil in most cases. Though Arcadia is clearly painted as a more scheming and power-hungry empire, the more you learn about the intricacies, the more you understand just how human all sides of this war and struggle are. Though some Arcadian soldiers are cruel and callous, others go out of their way to ensure the safety of many Dalmatian citizens. And contrary to many evil empires, Arcadia favors democratically elected leaders and gives people of the lowest class and rank ample opportunity to ascend. Though there are strong characters, Balthair being one of the strongest as he peppers what might be mundane dialogue with witty and sarcastic one-liners often befuddling Vaughn, 
The story is primarily focused on the large-scale events and is more a commentary on greed and ambition than it is an exploration or cataloging of one character's growth or coming of age. In fact, it's fair to say that Vaughn, the purported main character, is really just there to help humanize the adventure. He rarely develops as the story progresses outside of a few minor realizations. In fact, Bosch was initially intended to be the main character until Vaughn and Pinello were written in halfway through the project. Personally, my vote would have been for Balthair, but that would have changed the entire game. One thing's clear about the story, though. The mythology and lore are beautifully developed through the citizens, bestiary, and many voice-acted cutscenes. Wonderfully voice acted, I might add. Probably the best I've heard from that era and can still compete with many modern titles. It's scary to think that a 90 plus hour story driven game could have been double that had the team not cut down on the amount of literature they were producing around the game. It's a far deeper world than most seem to want to give it credit for. However, a deep world doesn't instantly give it life or vitality. It is easy to discern why some quickly lost interest with a story that takes many hours to get moving and even more to introduce the primary antagonist, and between all of this, the player has to withstand numerous lengthy, high-minded monologues and expositions. Expositions that occasionally left more unanswered than addressed. While it's difficult to deny the depth of the world, it does suffer from inconsistencies. Jumping from excellent dialogue and entertaining exchanges between the primary party, and really, some of Fran and Balthier's back and forth are wonderfully written, and the game's most emotional moments usually involve Balthier. But then slowing down with discussions of kingdom building and military strategy in allusion to beings and past events that aren't immediately clear makes for a sometimes disjointed experience. Seeing how the war and occupation affected certain characters on more than a superficial level might have resonated with more people. The game definitely attempted to address large-scale suffering, but might have missed the mark by not concentrating on the personal plights. They certainly hit on some of Ash and Bosch's individual struggles, but it just didn't feel deep enough. It's not for everyone, but if you can handle the slower bits, it certainly rewards the attentive gamer and is one of the more complete epics in the Final Fantasy series. Final Fantasy XII uses a fighting system called Active Dimension Battle, or ADB where the characters are free to roam around the battlefield and position themselves accordingly, though, unfortunately, positional strategy rarely comes into play outside of some very difficult marks and high-end bosses. There are no random encounters, and reminiscent of Final Fantasy XI, all enemies are visible as you're exploring and there is no transition to a separate battlefield. There are loads of docile monsters that only react if provoked, which is usually accomplished by attacking them, using magic around them, or attacking a monster of the same genus. Weather also plays a huge role in combat as it affects the potency of spells and different treasure chests and events can also be associated with different seasons. You can easily sub in characters outside of and during battle so long as they aren't being targeted or performing an action. Escaping is easy too, as you only need to hold R2 and move away from a monster's zone of aggression, similar to an MMO, and you can only get a game over if all characters have died. Battle chains are an excellent example of encouraging combat, and it makes the tedium of grinding quite a bit less monotonous. You start a chain by killing two of the same type of monster. The chain continues, and as it increases, the monsters drop rarer items and more than one item. As you increase the chain, party buffs and heals start to drop as well. It's an incentive to really grind out an area and overlevel, which is often necessary as the game's difficulty periodically spikes to unexpected levels. So much so that the game often prompts you to save when entering a new area because of this spike. Gaining money is also facilitated by this system, which can be difficult without chaining together monsters that drop high value items. It's a must if you plan on using the bazaar to unlock some of the absurdly powerful weapons and equipment. The bazaar system works by unlocking specific items and materials after you've sold a designated number of a drop. It's a fun system, but, like almost all systems in this game, it contains a few quirks, such as selling 20 of an item when only 5 is needed to create a new item, and having the bazaar eat the remaining and only credit you with unlocking 1, when you should have had 4. You end up needing to seek out bazaar guides to ensure you aren't losing items. And this is a troubling trend you'll note throughout the game. Some aspects of the game feel so hidden that you have to have a guide to know exactly what to do and how to do it. You can only control one character in combat, which in other games can equate to disaster for your inept AI partners. But Final Fantasy XII addresses this problem with a wonderfully complex but easy to learn and use system. The Gambit System. The Gambit System was conceived early on by battle system designer Hiroshi Tomamatsu. He likened the specific gambits to American football because every team member has a specific role to fulfill 
that alters based on circumstances and the desired outcome. It allows you to set a few conditions and determine how your player will respond to it. So you can set a condition to any ally that goes under 30% health and have a character respond by healing in any way you'd like, be it curing, using a potion, or anything you'd like to do once that condition is met. It also functions on a priority system. The highest gambit always takes priority. Seems simple enough, but there are certainly tricks and cool adjustments that can be made to pull more out of it than first meets the eye. However, this system alone seemed to either win over players or entirely alienate them. Many felt that the gambits reduced you to the legs of the player rather than the brains. That once you'd unlocked enough gambits and knew a boss's or enemy's patterns, the game could literally play itself. While this statement is absolutely accurate, you certainly can set up a series of gambits and run around without much worry, though you'd need to adjust them to different areas and different monsters' tendencies. Personally, I found the best method was setting some broad conditions that address common status effects and situations and handle all other battle states manually. This way still utilizes the great gambit system and keeps the player on his or her toes, forcing you to actually be engaged. The second contentious system is the license board system. It's very similar to Final Fantasy X's Sphere Grid in many ways, but diverges enough to give it a distinct feel. In order to use spells or equip weapons and armor, they had to be unlocked on the license board, and they needed to be unlocked by every character that you wanted to use that spell or piece of equipment. And they needed to be purchased and equipped, though the purchase was a one-time buy for spells. However, the board also includes a lot of statistical increases and item usage enhancements in the form of augments. Active characters still gain experience, and levels boost statistics as well, and though each character has slight innate strengths and weaknesses, they usually aren't pronounced enough that taking a character with high innate magic proficiency down a melee path would render them ineffective. In fact, these slight advantages are often moot by midway through the game. Gamers that love seeing massive improvements after a long grind session will adore this system. Early game, augments are cheap and provide noticeable boost to your character's performance. It's easy to specialize a character in areas you need or want early. However, and this is the primary complaint among detractors, by mid to late game the characters become homogenized as they move from specialized areas to other parts of the board that other characters previously or currently occupy. The end result is a party full of characters that can do everything needed. It loses that feel of individuality and strategizing for a boss around particular character strengths and weaknesses. While I personally enjoy these kinds of progression systems, there is no denying the eventual homogenization of your characters and the disappearance of that feel of character uniqueness. The re-release of Final Fantasy XII in Japan, subtitled Zodiac Job System, actually address this by adding separate license boards that correspond to specific jobs and roles. I'm glad they addressed it, but it's an upsetting oversight in the original game that leaves a lot of players feeling like their early decisions in the game meant little, and in reality, they probably don't because of this. Summons in Final Fantasy XII are called Espers, and are unlocked via the license board by one character and one character only, and the Espers don't become available until after they've been defeated. There are five that you encounter during the story, and eight hidden throughout Ivalice. Once summoned, an Esper replaces the two characters that didn't unlock the Esper during battle, leaving one character and an Esper. To put this politely, I simply don't enjoy summons at all in Final Fantasy XII. Other than the decision to spurn classic summons and go with less popular beasts, I didn't feel like this was implemented in a way that complemented the combat system. It actually slowed down the combat system in most cases and contradicted the usual flow of battle and just didn't have that Final Fantasy over-the-top devastating feel that most summons carry with them in previous titles. Having the Esper roam the battlefield with you or not deplete fractions of your MP based on its tier would have felt less overbearing and underwhelming. This nerfing of summons felt like a response to the slow increase in power of summons title after title, but this was perhaps a little too hard of a hit and ended up feeling too cumbersome and poorly executed. Another aspect of combat is Mist Quickenings. These are 12's version of Limit Breaks. They are available on the license board to unlock and each character can only have 3. After the second unlock it doubles the base MP and cuts your bar in 2. Two, the third unlock cuts it into three bars and triples your base MP. When you activate a quickening, you can chain them with other players that have quickenings. The chaining is based on luck and the timer shortens with each subsequent chain. Most quickenings damage a single enemy, but certain combinations will enact a concurrence. Concurrences deal massive damage to the primary target and all foes in close proximity. While both espers and quickenings can be fun to use, and quickenings can be a cheap way to burst down a boss that you might not have been prepared for, both aspects of combat felt tacked on and underdeveloped. 
cut away static scenes with button mashing combinations. You essentially have to constantly hit the reset button if a character's corresponding button doesn't appear during a quickening. Clashes with the fast paced in and out of battle base combat system. Some of the character's animations during quickenings are impressive and appropriately themed, but it just doesn't feel right or cohesive. The hunts, though, completely won me over. You acquire hunts by checking bulletin boards that are usually located in taverns. The monsters you hunt are called marks. After checking with the petitioner, which is the individual that posted the mark, and accepting the hunt, you must then locate the monster in the world. The petitioner usually gives directions that are adequate enough to locate the mark without any added research, though sometimes there are conditions that must be met before the mark will appear that can be tough to figure out without a guide. Defeating marks results in some type of reward from either the petitioner or the clan centurio which is a group of hunters and is led by Mont Blanc. Yes, the same Moogle that was a playable character from Final Fantasy Tactics. This game is based in the same universe, which is a cool little tidbit of information. He often gives you elite marks and adds extra rewards for taking down tough bosses and monsters, a lot of which aren't even marks. Normal marks are typically very strong in one area, or utilize one devastating attack or follow one specific pattern. So long as you're leveled up and paying attention to the large attacks and patterns, you'll rarely struggle against these marks. The elite marks, though, often incorporate different patterns for different phases of the fight and actively respond to certain abilities by the player. There are so many strategies one can utilize to take down the different marks, and it's a blast to experiment with different abilities to bring these beasts down. It's a great diversion from the game story and provides a reason to continue playing if you've completed the story. The last elite mark, Yasmat, has 50 million HP and can take a few hours to take down. He casts instant death, repeatedly buffs himself, and can fully reheal himself when he hits 6 million HP by reflecting a renew spell off the party if they aren't careful, effectively canceling an hour or more of progress. The mark system was a great addition, and completionists will love it, or slam their controllers down in extreme frustration, but it's nevertheless one of the best parts of the game. With all these different mechanics at play, and the inclusion of a world that is nearly entirely accessible from level 1, there are many ways to game the system. Some felt this added to the depth of the combat and the experience, while others felt it facilitated abuse. It's really however you choose to view it. There were ways to, at very early levels, trick a higher level monster called Dustia into spawning, using a phoenix down to kill him, he's undead so one phoenix down defeats him, and then dezoning to trick the game into thinking he hadn't died, while still collecting the item and experience. This is just one of the many ways to abuse the trend of placing higher level monsters in lower areas, while also including chain mechanics and rare skills and drops, with spells and accessories that have interesting and occasionally game-breaking effects, like an accessory that reverses all of the item's intended effects. Think about all of the havoc that can cause on a monster. One remedy destroys an enemy. If you have the right information, you can acquire the Demon's Bane sword 8 to 10 levels prior to when you'd ordinarily get it, effectively nullifying any bosses and tough fights during that period. I personally enjoy finding these secrets and going that extra mile to locate a hidden object or to be challenged by a game, but the problem is that many of these secrets were ridiculously hidden and at times counterintuitive, like passing up very specific early game chests to guarantee your chance at a Zodiac Spear, which is coincidentally one of the best weapons in the game. So after spending 60 plus hours on a game, you weren't allowed to get one of the best weapons in the game because of a mistake you'd made in the first hour. And you really had no way of knowing and no indication that you'd even made an error. Just feels punishing. It ended up feeling like a ploy to get people to purchase a strategy guide. Which, at the time, attempting to sell a game with a strategy guide was sort of the early 2000s version of day one DLC content. It's easy to play through the game without it, and the occasional difficulty spike is easily addressed by simply finding an area, even if it isn't the most efficient, and grinding a bit. You're just not going to acquire some of the hidden gems the game has to offer in the item and hidden monster departments. The soundtrack, though not up to par with the other iconic Final Fantasy titles, is still one that deserves attention. It's just nearly impossible to follow in the steps of Nobu Uematsu. Despite a ridiculously long production period that included a lot of infighting about direction and eventually led to the legendary Yasumi Matsuno, the director of Final Fantasy Tactics, stepping down due to health concerns and overwork, Final Fantasy XII's high points vastly outweigh its several, admittedly pronounced, flaws. If you like ambitious stories with great set pieces and challenges around every corner, Final Fantasy XII is the game for you. But be prepared to invest a lot of time to learning its peculiarities and allow the story to unfold before judging it too harshly. The story has a lot of depth and emotional pull if given that time. If you've made it this far, I appreciate you guys hanging in there. This was a tremendously long game that wouldn't have been properly served with an 8 minute review. If you liked the video, 
Don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment. This has been Andrew with High Level Reviews, and I appreciate you guys stopping by.